him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the road, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. Then the multitude warned them that they should be quiet, but they cried out, cried out all the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. David. So Jesus stood and told them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, that our eyes may be open. So Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. I am such a good mood right now because I stopped by the fellowship hall on my way in. There's just something magic about smelling Traeger smoke as you enter into the house of the Lord. I, I think it's kind of reminiscent of that Old Testament worship where, you know, burnt sacrifices offered, the incense, I don't know. Or I might be reading too much into that. Anyway, anybody who knows me knows I love potluck. Today we are looking at uh, part three of the series, Knowing the Heart of Jesus, Compassion and Action. Words, words are easy. Words are easy. Saying you're a thing doesn't mean you're that thing. After decades of watching actors, we've become pretty good as a people to become actors ourselves. Some people even end up believing this imitation projection in which they give. They think it's true of themselves. Jesus said, I am meek and lowly, I am gentle and humble. And his actions in the Gospels back that up. They weren't just words, they were proven to be true. So what Jesus did proved who he is. And Jesus could only offer rest for our souls if he could actually, what, provide it. So, Matthew chapter 8. Let's go there for a moment. Matthew chapter 8. It says, when he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will... You can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, what? See that no one, you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. When the leper said, if you will, this captures a sentiment of not so much if he was able as much as if he desired to do it. Basically what he is saying, he's saying, Lord, if you desire, you can make me clean. And Jesus said, I do desire to do that. Be clean. And so why did Jesus cleanse the leper? Why, why did Jesus touch the leper to make him clean? It's because he had pity. He had compassion. In Matthew 9, 36, it says, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And so town after town after town, as we read in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus is healing the people. He is teaching the people. He heals their diseases, then he heals their thinking. And Christ's heart is what drove his ministry. That's what compelled him to do things, even when he was exhausted. Even when he knew if he did a thing, it was going to cause a commotion and, and, and resistance. He still did it. Time after time, we see Christ approaching people who were considered in their day and time morally repulsive. They were reviled. They were the poor. They were the ignored. And those are the kind of people that Jesus gravitated to. And people who are what we would call higher-ups, 
labeled him a friend of sinners because he hung around who? You, thank you. It said he was a, a friend of drunkards and, and gluttons. They even called him a drunkard and a glutton. Why? Because he's hanging around who? Sinners. Aren't you glad he was hanging around those folks? No, 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 no. Aren't you glad that he is still hanging around those folks? Because, friend, that's who we are. I mean, we may look nice on the outside and all dressed up and have our hair just right and everything going on and drive a whatever a car coming in the parking lot and have a nice house. And those things are blessings and wonderful to have. Amen? Yeah. That doesn't mean inside's clean and squared away and looking too good. It doesn't mean that at all. And I'm really glad that Jesus hung around with sinners because that's what I've been and that's what I am. I'm a, I'm a mess. And <laughs> uh, John, edit that YouTube video where your wife agrees in front of everybody that I am a mess. When I came to the Bible, I needed saving. When I came to the Bible, I needed help. What I found in the Gospel of Mark was a friend. More than a healer, more than Messiah, a friend. Next slide. You guys know this song? There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. Slow down. No, not one. No, not one. None else could heal. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. You guys sound so good today. I, I wish I wrote that song. It is so good. It's such a great song. You see, what he came to do was to prove that he wasn't just the almighty and, and, and the, the, the authority and the power and the presence and the majesty. He was all those things. But he came here to make sure that we understood that he wanted to be our friend. When you're reading the Gospels, what, what aspect of Jesus stands out most prominently? What part of his composite shines to you? Was he the fulfillment of the Old Testament law? Was he the fulfillment of the hopes and, 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 and the longings of the Old Testament? Absolutely. Was he, was he, did he possess holiness to a degree that when the demon-possessed saw him, they shuddered and they begged him not to cast them out into the wilderness? Absolutely. Did his wisdom outstrip all the scholars of the day? Absolutely. He had authority. He had authority over nature. He had authority over the laws of physics. He had authority over the dead. But are those the things that we love most about Jesus? That he walked on the water and he fed the 5,000 and he healed the, lip, the lepers and blind people. What I love the most is that he wanted to be with those kinds of people. The thing that I first was struck by when I first read Scripture as a 22-year-old drug addict is that Jesus came 
to seek. And once he sought, he saved. I still love that about him the most, right? The shepherd that leaves the flock to go find the one, right? And in the Gospels we read, uh, he, he touches, he embraces, he, he forgives, he puts up with, <laughs> he corrects, he realigns, okay? And he changed people. How many of you read First John last, the last week? You know, where Boanerges became the, God, the, the apostle of love, agape, is still so stunning. What a great little book to read. And so, why does God's Son seek out the lowest kind of people because he wants to save them? And, and why, does, why does he forgive them? Well, that could be an entire series of sermons. But I think for this moment, let's, let's just look at one facet of that multifaceted diamond. Why did Jesus come to forgive us of our sins? Why is it that he forgave those kinds of people? And the reason why is because they are the ones who desired it more. Because not everybody wants to be forgiven by Jesus. A lot of people don't think they have anything to be forgiven of. They have bought into the rhetoric, the propaganda of our culture, that you are okay and you're fine and you don't need to make any changes because you're just awesome the way you are. And there's a lot of people that don't feel like they need a Savior. Why? Because they've been told by our culture, their, sin is an archaic term. It no longer applies. We're not sinners. We're, we just have disorders. Right? Now, Jesus didn't forgive everyone. This brings up an uncomfortable point. What about the harsher side of Christ? How we love that loving, sacrificial shepherd who cares for his lambs. We love that aspect of Christ. And this is the reason why we wear crosses around our neck, and this is the reason why we hang crosses in our walls, is because it reminds us of his love and his, his desire to rescue. We don't like passages that show that Jesus is in a bad mood. We don't like passages that show that he's angry. We really don't like passages that show that he is filled with wrath. Those are passages, they don't get preached a lot. And we can so over-exaggerate the affection that Christ has for us that we no longer want to look at the harsher side of Christ. And we can't afford to over-celebrate one side of God while ignoring the other. Romans eleven twenty two 22 says, Therefore, consider the goodness and the severity of God. God has what? He's got two sides. On those who fell, severity, but toward you, goodness, if, what? You continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you'll also be cut off. J.I. Packer said, a half-truth masquerading as the whole truth becomes a complete untruth. If all you know is one side of God, you don't know God. If all you know is the loving, kind, tender, sacrificial, dying on a cross for your sins, Jesus, then that's, you don't know Jesus because there's an entirely different side to him. Even though it's uncomfortable and even though it, it, it's not popular, it remains the fact that Jesus Christ is not a just one-sided coin. And I just want you to consider this. That the wrath of Christ and the mercy of Jesus are not at odds with one another. Haven't you found it be true in your life? The more you care, the more you care. If you love someone a lot, don't you hate what threatens that person? Yes or no? You see, if you don't care what, about a person, then you don't care what happens to that person. There's a word for that. What is it? Apathy. That's the word. And man, we're surrounded by people with apathy. 
They don't care, and they don't care that they don't care. They don't feel for anything except for themselves. And you see, if evil is causing someone to suffer, if you love that person and you care about that person, then it brings out a part of you that isn't gentle and tender and kind. It's force. It's confrontation. It's strength. Amen? We need strength when strong forces prevail. And to have a harsher side doesn't contradict who Jesus is. It actually is a manifestation of his mercy. To stop people being in misery compels one to be serious and strong and sometimes hard. So we don't want to ignore the harsher side just because we're looking at his heart. Another point today is the clean among the unclean. As you read the Gospels, Jesus is referring to unclean spirits and people are coming to him who are unclean by the law of Moses. This leper was unclean. This man in Matthew chapter 8, by the law of Moses, was, to, was commanded to stay away from the rest of the people because he was contagious, because his disease was communicable. But another thing was, is that, I don't know if it's in the law, but it was certainly a tradition in Jesus' day that if you had leprosy and you're going through town, you have to call out to someone that you're coming your way. Wouldn't that be great? You're a leper, you got your body parts probably all covered so the people can't see your nose falling off or your digits that are missing from your hand. And as you come into town, you've got to say, unclean, unclean. And people, oh, and they get out of the way so that person could walk through, that leper could walk by him. Now, wouldn't that make you socially popular? And so there was a lot of focus on what was clean and unclean in Jesus' culture. And it was more than just physical hygiene. That's, that's why when, when Jesus heals this leper, he says, go to the priest. Because it had something to do with moral purity as well. The problem really wasn't dirt. The problem was guilt. And Christ is the cleanest person who ever walked the earth. He could be called the clean one. That would be a good title for him. And that's what makes it so dramatic that Jesus is actually touching this man. But by touching him, Jesus didn't become unclean. He cleaned that man. Why did he reach out and touch this leper? Because he pitied the life that this man was trapped in. Not only because of his skin disease, but because of the many hurts and the socially outcast as an untouchable. And Jesus knows everybody needs a hug. Everybody needs something that words cannot do. Warm hugs heal a lot of hurts. Amen? They do. That's why a lot of you come to this church building. You're standing there ready for one. I know you by name. Hugs are good. We love hugs. In Luke chapter 7, it talks about this sinful woman that came to Jesus. Jesus invited to this man's house, Simon, and he's a Pharisee, and, he, and uh, Jesus is, is reclining at the table, and uh, this woman comes in, and, and, and this woman is, is wanting to anoint him with some ointment that she has brought, and, uh, but she begins to sob in his presence, and, and, and her tears are falling on his feet. She undoes her hair and uses her hair as a towel to wipe the tears off his feet. And Simon is just going, this man can't be a prophet. He can't be a prophet of God because he would know that this woman is a sinner. What kind of woman this is? is letting, he's letting this woman touch him? I mean, that's breaking all the etiquette, all the protocols in the day, Okay. And why did Jesus let her do that? This unclean woman whose sins were many were allowed to teach the clean one. And why? Because he cared about her. 
because he knew that she needed access and he allowed that. He wanted her to know that he wanted to make her clean. He desired that. In fact, he didn't want to just make her sins absolved. He wanted her to be whole. And this is the heart of Jesus. The heart of Jesus is restoration. And Jesus went from one place to another, casting out demons and raising the dead. Why? Because he wanted those lives restored to that original intended glory that God gave. How many times do we see him restoring someone? He restored the man who had a shriveled hand. He, he, re, he restored the man who was crippled from birth. He, he restored the blind, those who were blind their entire life. He restored the woman who was cursed with an issue of blood. I, I think we tend to see these miracles and, and, and we think, well, the reason why he did those is so that he could prove that he was from God and whatever he said was true. I completely agree that he did perform miracles to prove to people that he was actually speaking truth from God. But I'm not sure how many of us understand the reason why he healed that woman and he really healed the cripples and, and, and the blind is because he, his heart was broken for those people. You see, when Satan destroys, Jesus restores. And Satan is still seeking to destroy and he does. But God's precious children, those who are in the image of Christ, we seek to restore. We learn that from him. The original restoration movement didn't happen in the frontiers of America in the early 1800s. No, actually it was seen 1800 years earlier you can read about it in the Gospels when Jesus moves toward a damaged person or a demon-possessed person and he restored their life to holiness. The original restoration movement is Jesus Christ himself. Amen. Amen. That's what he did. And isn't it great just to think that he did that? That it says something hopeful that Jesus wants to restore us. And the beautiful thing is, he still does. Right now. The same Jesus that wept at the tomb of Lazarus weeps when we are completely devastated by life. The same Jesus that lifted the cripple to their feet lifts us up so that we can walk alongside him. Amen. The same Jesus that cast out unclean spirits reaches into our souls and he cleanses us from all those unclean things we've allowed to take up residence inside of our spirit. In other words, if compassion put on flesh and walked the, the face of the earth, what would it look like? We don't have to wonder. So Jesus' actions here on earth spoke much louder than his words. Those acts of compassion are what transformed sinners to saints, it motivated the selfish to become selfless. Christ's followers were just that. Followers. Doers. They followed not only his commands, but they followed his example. And it was these followers that endured horrible, horrible persecution. And, and they were the ones who convinced idol worshipers to turn to Christ for salvation. And, and it was those early disciples that touched the untouchables and prayed for their enemies. Where did they learn that? Because no one ever, ever had done that before Christ. And why did those early Christians pray for their tormentors? Why did they try and help the people that hated them? I 
I wonder sometimes how many people come into this auditorium because they're afraid of what will happen to them if they don't. They don't want to be in jeopardy with God, so they show up and that appeases or alleviates their anxiety that they may have. I wonder how many people come in here on Sunday mornings into this auditorium because they love God and they want to be here. I wonder how many people here have asked God on the way here, would you please open my eyes to someone who needs to be lifted? That's compassion in action. And so, Jesus, he gives us an invitation, doesn't he? It's so beautiful. Let's look at it again together. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. That is the invitation today. If you feel God calling you to answer that, let us know as we stand and sing.